Thank you very much for joining us in this webinar. Uh, my name is Gail Downs. I'm a Professor Emerita of Sociology and Women's Studies, and I have been studying the effects of pornography, the business of pornography, the impact of pornography for over 30 years now. And um, I'm very sad to say that since I've been studying this, everything has gotten so much worse in ways that I could you know, when I first started this, I couldn't have envisaged what we have today. So what I am going to do today is kind of take you through the story of pornography, how it became, what it was to what it is, and to explain that, you know, it's no longer, as we know, in the back streets. There's no longer in porn shops. Um, you don't have to go into alleyways and find a porn shop, be over 18. That has moved way away and I want to talk about as it's moved and gotten much more violent that kind of feminism or what is mainstream feminism has become kind of more apologetic to pornography which when you think is ridiculous because if anything we really need to be more um, organized uh, braver and fighting the porn industry in a way we never have before because it just becomes so much more violent. So really, how did we get from this playboy right to where we are? And I'm going to do a little bit of a history just to get you an idea. So first of all, whenever I give a talk, one of the questions is, well, hasn't there always been pornography? And the answer to that is, yes, of course. You know, we know even in cave dwellings, there was pornographic imagery. But that's not the same as a porn industry. And we haven't always had a porn industry. In fact, if you want to think about the porn industry, it began really in 1953 with the first edition of Playboy with Marilyn Monroe on the front. <clears throat> she, by the way, was very upset with this image, did not want <coughs> to do this. You have to used it against her will. And in some horrible twist of irony, when, Hef when uh, Marilyn Monroe died, Hugh Hefner bought the um, burial plot next to her, and he's actually buried next to her. So even in death, this man will not leave Marilyn Monroe alone. Um, so in 1953, Hefner launched the first edition of Playboy. It became almost an overnight success, and this is really what started the porn industry, because never before had pornography circulated within the mainstream channels of international capitalism. That's really what you find it as an industry, is it starts to interlock with other forms of capital inst capitalist institutions, such as advertising, especially advertising. So um, we have 1953, Playboy comes out, Hefner thinks he's going to jail, in fact he becomes a millionaire, and he really, him and Playboy run the softcore porn industry, have virtually no competition, until in 1969, there is an ad in the Chicago Tribune with the picture of a bunny in the crosshairs of a rifle. And underneath it says, we're going bunny hunting. That was the first ad to launch Penthouse in the United States. So in 1969, Penthouse comes out. And it's kind of a little bit more hardcore. I mean, nothing compared to what it is today. And what happens between um, 50 between 69 and 1973 is a war between Penthouse and Playboy to see who can produce the more explicit magazine. And this was a really important part of history because, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got allergies from hay fever here in Boston. Um, what happened is that it groomed the American public to accept slightly more hardcore porn. So from 69 to 73 is this battle between Playboy and Penthouse, each one trying to be more explicit. In the end, Penthouse won the battle but lost the war. The reason being they became so hardcore that all the advertisers ran back to Playboy, which is why Playboy continued to have its number one premier position as a porn magazine. Now, importantly, watching from the sidelines and seeing the whole industry become more hardcore was a strip club owner from Ohio called Larry Flint, who in 73 brought out the first edition of Hustler. And by the way, trigger warning, I'm sorry I should have given that in the beginning. Um, some of these slides and images are going to be difficult. Please feel free not to look, just listen, or if you need to, log off. 
So what happened is Hustler really became the mainstream hardcore. And I remember when I first started doing this research and Hustler was the most hardcore in the mainstream, thinking just how awful it was. And you know, in some bizarre way, I never thought I'd be nostalgic for Playboy, Penthouse and Hustler because this is absolutely nothing compared to what we're dealing with today. Because now we have Pornhub. And I'm going to discuss Pornhub a bit later. This is critical because Pornhub is owned by MindGeek, which I'm going to talk about later. And if you want to think about MindGeek, think of the Amazon of the porn industry. Now, as I said in the beginning, bizarrely, as all this has gotten so much worse, feminism has become more apologetic, become more... Um, I want to say in bed with the pornography industry, although in some cases that's happened. There's been a kind of faux feminism that has grown up, <clears throat> often called third wave feminism, postmodern feminism. But I want you to take a look at this for a moment. And this was in the late 70s in Times Square fighting the porn industry. And thousands and thousands of women came out to fight the porn industry. And there was no question about, is porn empowering? Is porn good for women? It was clear as day, which I'll explain later, that pornography is violence against women in both its construction and in its consumption. So if you just take a look at this for a second and see who's here, and you see the only men is the policeman and the guy jeering on the side taking pictures. Now, how did we get from that to this, slot walks. How did we get from a feminism that said that pornography is violence against women, that women are not sluts, to a movement that actually says we need slut pride? Notice, by the way, how many men are actually involved in this march, man holding the slut pride. I mean, I think what I always argue is men love this idea. They think women are sluts. They read porn. Women are sluts in porn. And um, although the slut walk in the beginning was supposed to um, really argue against blaming women for being victimized sexually, to call it a slut walk was to argue that women are indeed sluts. And I refuse to accept that. Slut is a patriarchal invention done to shame women's uh, sexuality. And that's why the term slut shaming is so ridiculous. Because how do you shame a concept such as slut that's already meant to shame. So you can't slut shame because by very virtue of calling a woman a slut, you're shaming her. So we need to throw that word out of our vocabulary, just like we need to throw many words, which I'm going to be talking about, like sex work, out of the vocabulary of so-called feminism to call it what it is, because words really matter. And when we confuse the concepts and start arguing with the slut pride, what we do is we acquiesce and we collaborate with patriarchy. So what I'm going to do is look at mainstream porn today, which looks nothing like Playboy, Penthouse, or Hustler. It looks very different. So some statistics. Porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. So think about that just for a second. Think about how, many, how much traffic that is and how much part of the culture pornography has become. We know, depending on whichever methodology you do, that pornography is about a third of the internet, whether it's in downloads or traffic. It literally cannibalized the internet in 2000. Also, a lot of the money to develop the internet and develop different features like pop-ups, pop-downs, etc., was actually porn money because the pornographers knew that the more affordable, the more anonymous, and the more accessible pornography would become, the more they would build up a huge profit base and obviously client base. So pornography really is hand in hand with the porn industry, with um, the mainstream development of the internet. And it was almost overnight when the internet became domesticated that the pornographers suddenly took over. Now I want to say something about how we should think about pornography. And I'm going to quote here a pornographer. A lot of people get distracted from the business model by the sex. It, pornography, is just as sophisticated and multi-layered as any other marketplace. We operate just like any other Fortune 500 company. So 
again, begin to think about pornography as an industry. This answers a lot of the so pro pro porn arguments about, well, what about ethical porn? What about feminist porn? No. No, the question is, what about the multi-billion dollar porn industry that the vast majority of men who consume porn consume? Um, it's like arguing that, you know, we shouldn't be against, um, I don't know, uh, genetically modified food because we've got somebody I know next door who sells organic tomatoes. I mean, that's a ridiculous argument to fight the genetic, to fight the uh, food industry. We have to think about that which people consume. And that which people consume is mainstream hardcore porn, and as I'll explain, mainly from the free porn sites. Interesting thing, I was at a conference quite a few years ago, and it was an academic conference in England. I actually live in the United States, and I went to England for a few conferences. And at one point, the academics who were on the uh, opening panel were saying how there's no such thing as it. There's no such thing as a porn industry. And what was their argument? Well, there's no such thing as a porn industry, they said, because there's just so much porn. How can there possibly be an industry when there's just so much porn? Which, of course, makes absolutely no sense. It's like being at a conference on automobiles and saying, you know, there's no car industry because there's just so many cars. There's red cars, green cars, blue cars. How can there possibly be a car industry? It would make no sense if you applied that argument that there can't be a porn industry because there's so much porn. There is so much porn because there's a porn industry. So this is kind of the position that a lot of the pro-porn academics take is they don't really follow the business model. They don't understand how it works and they don't understand how the business model shapes the content, and I'm going to discuss some of that later. Now, if you're looking at it from a business perspective, what you have to understand is that porn businesses, like all businesses, raise capital, they undergo mergers and acquisitions, they have trade shows, they have PR firms, and most importantly, they interface with banks, credit card companies, venture capitalists, cable operators, etc. Now, people often say to me, if we did anything to regulate the porn industry, it would go underground. Wouldn't that be a problem? And my argument is, that's exactly where it should be. Because when you bring pornography above ground, what you do is you stitch it in to mainstream capitalism. So you have banks, credit card companies, venture capitalists, cable operators, I mean, the whole of the internet actually rooting for the porn industry because they are making so much money from porn. This is why it has become such big business and such part of our culture. It's because of the profit. And if it sells, it's not sex that sells, it's violence against women that sells, um, then what we're doing is we are making our culture pornified to the point that it is becoming a danger zone. It, in fact, it is a danger zone for women and children to live today in this culture. I want to explain one of the ways in which pornography interfaces with mainstream capitalism. So in um, California, there was hearings um, with Kink.com and OSHA, which is the kind of um, workplace, uh, government workplace regulator. And um, they asked, OSHA asked the CFO of Kink.com, why do you do a before and after video. Now, for those of you who don't know what kink.com is, it's actually a very clear torture website. The stuff they do to women is unbelievable. I mean, I can, I who, you know, developed a tough skin around this, I can barely stand to watch it given the violence. So this is where they often electrocute women's labia, they waterboard the women. It's, if they did it to any other group, we would see it for the torture that it is. So they asked the CFO of kink.com, um, why do you do a before video where the woman, the young woman says, oh, I can't wait to work for kink.com. I've always wanted to do it. And then after they've absolutely destroyed her and she's lying on the floor and can barely move, they do an after video. And they say, did you like that? And she says, yes, I love it. I can't wait to do it again. And this is really, in every kink video, this is their format. So OSHA said, why? And what the CFO of kink.com said is the reason is that when I became CFO of kink.com, he said, I went to Visa and MasterCard and I asked them, what do I need to do at kink in order for you to process Visa and MasterCard? And what he said was, 
make a before and after video so you can see that the women consent. Now I tell this story because it is a prime example of just how much porn and Visa and MasterCard intersect. If they have this power and if MasterCard and Visa are setting the protocols, think about the way in which pornography has become so mainstream. We have come a long way from that shop in the back streets where you had guys in dirty raincoats buying porn. Now interestingly, when you think of pornography, you have to think of the corporatization of porn. And as this says, the corporatization of porn isn't something that is going to happen, it actually happened. And this was in 2009. And what that means is really monopolies growing up around production and consumption, but mainly consumption. So porn is at the, if you think of the uh, production side of the value chain, you've got lots of producers. But if you think of the distribution side, then you have a very concentrated number of distributors. And for that, you need to talk about MindGeek. MindGeek was founded by Fabian Thyman. He was kicked out in the sometime in the two, uh, 2000, I think 2010, because he was under house arrest for um, tax evasion. But MindGeek is crucial because now it literally monopolizes the distribution end of the porn chain. And the reason for that is it owns most of the free porn sites. And especially it owns Pornhub. Now, Pornhub is the most trafficked porn website in the world. And these are some statistics from Pornhub in 2019. And every year Pornhub publishes its stats. 42 billion visits in 2019. That was up from 33 billion in 2018. Daily average of 100 million visitors, 962 searches per second. They uploaded nearly 5 million new videos in one year. Just get your head around that, 5 million new videos. And they created over 1 million hours of new content. So if you live to be God knows what, you are never going to see all that's on Pornhub. I remember Andrea Dworkin once saying, before even the internet, she said, there's never enough porn. And she was absolutely right. You always have to be novel, producing more and more stuff, doing more and more bizarre stuff in order to keep the users interested. Now, Pornhub boasts that 100 million daily visits is if the combined population of Canada, Poland, Netherlands, and Australia visited Pornhub every day. So again, think of how many mainly men, there are some women who look at porn, but it's mainly men are looking at the hardcore violent porn, masturbating to it every single day. And before people argue masturbation is not the problem, it's masturbating to images of violence against women that's the problem. Now, just as you think, you know, the industry can't get any more depraved, they managed to. So let's look at Pornhub traffic during the pandemic. So in March, we saw an increase, and by March it was 120 million a day, going up to 134 million a day. And there's two reasons. Number one is because we're all quarantining, or many of us, more men are at home all day. And secondly, what Pornhub did very smartly is it's made its premium content free. And this is a great way to make sure that when all this is over, the guys will keep up with the premium porn hub, but will have to pay for it. So again, they're thinking, even in the middle of something like, you know, we've not seen in our lifetime, they're thinking of new ways to build revenue streams. So let me give you some statistics. In Italy, when they made Pornhub premium free, visits went up to Pornhub 57%. In France, 38%, and in Spain, 61%. We also know, as many of us have been following, is that calls to um, crisis centres and to um, shelters have increased during the lockdown. Now, obviously, it's not only around pornography. But pornography, as we'll talk about later, does cause increased levels of violence against women. So what we need to think about is what does it mean 
that we have increased this level of increase of men using porn and also they're home all day, a lot of them, so they can be using it all day. Now in the US porn in the US the Pornhub traffic peaks at 3 a.m. And it's interesting because I was looking at some articles and I was trying to figure out, you know, why 3 a.m. And a lot of the articles say because people are going to bed later and they don't have to get up for work. So that's why it's peaking at 3 a.m. instead of um, 1 a.m. or whatever it was before. Well, first of all, let's be clear about this. It's not people. And they're not going to bed later because they don't have to get up for work. They're waiting till everyone in the home goes to bed so that they can then go on their pornography. So again, people, whenever you see people, always get suspicious, especially if you're talking about pornography, because you need to talk about women and men. And also, they said that people have got less work to do. Women haven't. Women, there was just an article today in the New York Times about how stressful all of this is on women because they're the ones doing working from home, taking care of children, also doing the um, homeschooling. So women are not got less work to do. So the whole idea that somehow we're all, these people are relaxed and just staying up does not take into account the reality of the women who are in lockdown, doing all the work and in lockdown with men who are using more pornography. Now, again, as I said, just as things can't get any worse, what we know is there are coronavirus-related searches on Pornhub now. To date, more than 15 million searches containing corona or COVID. And there has been more than a 1,000 corona-themed porn videos uploaded to Pornhub, with many being viewed over 1 million times. So, again, we see how every tragedy, every horror show that happens in the world, the pornographers find way to eroticize it and sexualize it, just as they do with Holocaust pornography, uh, rape pornography, you name it, they manage to eroticize it and sexualize it. And in fact, it's even more eroticized and sexualized because the women are doubly disempowered, and in this case, by virtue of having the virus and also being. Um, perpetrated by men. So what's actually in pornography? So this study that most academics point to as kind of the gold standard is Anna Bridges' study, which was published in Violence Against Women. And when they looked at the main downloaded scenes, they found that nearly 90% had at least a, some form of violence against women in it. And um, from what I gather, it's getting worse. I mean, I, I very, very rarely see anything on Pornhub that doesn't have violence against women in it. So what is the content of mainstream pornography? So when you go into Pornhub, they have by the side um, different categories. And it doesn't matter what category you go on to. Black porn, Asian porn, MILF, schoolgirl porn. These are the main sex acts in porn. Gagging, rough anal sex, ejaculation on face, ATM, hair pulling, and spitting in a face. So let me talk about some of this. And by the way, I should have added strangulation, because gagging is not the same as strangulation. So gagging is when the penis is so far down her throat that she can't breathe. And actually, you see her begin to choke. She can't breathe. And what's interesting in pornography is as she is choking, and tears are streaming down her face. The man pushes his penis, he rams it even further down her throat. Now, what makes people human is their capacity for empathy. And he's got none. He, all he does is just keep upping the violence as she's suffering more. Now, that's what a kind of psychopathic behavior. Do I think men who are performers in porn are psychopaths? I don't know. I'd need to do a study, or psychologists would need to do a study. What I do know is they behave like psychopaths. And then you have men masturbating to images of men behaving like psychopaths. So this is the problem. They show no empathy. They show no care for these women. These women can be crying, begging, pleading, asking them to stop. Makes no difference. They continue. 
Rough anal sex is very standard in pornography, and I mean really rough anal sex, where you woman is being pounded. And one of the problems with the women in pornography who performers is that their anuses literally often drop out of their body because they simply cannot take that level of violence. And the average woman in porn lasts about three months because of the violence done to her body. And anal prolapses are very common. Ejaculation on face, the money shot, um, standard. And that's usually three, four, five, six men um, orally, anally, vaginally penetrating a woman, pulling her hair, spitting in her face, calling her bitch, whore, cum dumpster, cunt, you name it. And then she's covered in ejaculate at the end, often in her eyes, so she can't see. So that's what you get in mainstream pornography. So when people, again, argue, and this is both women and men, come up with the ethical porn, um, I've looked at some of this so-called ethical porn or feminist porn, and a lot of it looks just like this. The only thing is you'll have a different type of body shape. Maybe the women are a little bit fuller, um, a bit larger, but that doesn't change the nature of pornography. It doesn't change what pornography is. It doesn't change that pornography is about the celebration of women as a subordinate sex class. And it delivers that message to men, to their brains, via the penis. That's what pornography does, and I don't care whether a woman is behind the camera or a man, it's the same narrative. Now I want to give you an example from gagonmycock.com. And you see here, they, they sort of don't hide what they do. It says here, we fuck them in the face till they cry. Cry they do, many times. Um, and then, when I was writing my book, Pornland, and I would see some of this, I would think to myself, and I would often be watching it, and I could barely stand to watch it, I think, if I can barely stand to watch it, what happens to this 8, 9, 10, 11 year old boy who puts boobies into um, Google, which is the kind of thing they put in, or butts, and think they're going to see maybe a naked woman, and they come up with this. How, how do they stay on this level of violence? And I started to read some of the text that goes with these websites. And then I began to understand what's going on. So let's take the website, Gag Me and Then Fuck Me. Do you know what we say to things like romance and foreplay? We say, fuck off. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. We make them gag till their makeup starts running and we give them a sticky bath. Now, this is very clever. Let's deconstruct it. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. Is that true? I don't think so. I don't think your nine-year-old is looking for gag me and then fuck me. And I don't think every man really wants to do this. But what they're doing is they're throwing out to these kids and to men, they're throwing out a kind of hook saying, are you man enough for this? Can you stand this? Because every man really likes it. And are you every man? Or are you too much of a, quote, pussy to stand this? And they actually say things like that. So it's a way to make pornography, violent pornography, a rite of passage for boys into, mas into patriarchal masculinity. Again, one of the major forms of violence in pornography is very violent um, anal sex. And let's go to the website for anally ripped whores, and this is the promotional copy. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. Chicks being ass fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy, and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. So, look at this. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. No, they don't. Again, they are saying to these boys and men, we know who you are. You are vile, you are disgusting, you are depraved, and this is what you want. Now, no doubt, there's many men who want this, and I would argue they want this because pornography has socialized them into wanting this. I do not think men are born rapists, are born porn users, are born batterers, but we live in a patriarchal culture that socializes them into that. And just as we socialize men into being these things, it is the job 
of a of feminism to make sure that we stop socializing men into being violent against women. Because if you can socialize them into it, you can socialize them out of it. And to take a biological argument is really, in a way, a politics of despair. It's to say, if you're going to have a biological argument, there's nothing you can do. Again, as Andrea Dworkin once said, if you believe that in biology men are born like this, then take it up with God, not me. So it's a, it's a way out. It's a really cheap way out to say boys will be boys. It's not. It's a product of a very sophisticated patriarchal socialization. Now, I want to talk about another theme in pornography, and that came up because of um, a law, Ashcroft versus the Free Speech Coalition in 2002. This was the Supreme Court. They struck down two provisions of the Child Pornography Prevention Act of 1996. Now, why is this important? The, one of the, the provisions they struck down is, number one, you can't use anyone under 18. And number two, um, no, sorry, they kept that provision, you can't use anyone under 18. What they struck down is you said you can't use anyone who looks under 18. It's okay to use girls and women or boys and men who look under 18, but they have to be 18, or so they say. So overnight, what happened is suddenly we started to see images like this which look like child porn. And the argument under Ashcroft would be, well, she is over 18, it's just so happened she looks young. But look at the way in which the bedding, the Disney theme bedding, look at her. So what you're doing here is you are creating a taste for young looking girls. Another example, it's my father, he's a big strong man, I'm in love with his body. Daddy's whore. There is no stronger feeling than a father's love for his daughter. What we're talking about here is incest. And it's okay, she's my stepdaughter. And we know that stepdaughters especially are at risk. And often what we know is that perpetrators will um, partner with women who have children of a certain age so that they have easy access to those children. So look at this. This is promoting it, celebrating it, legitimizing violence against children. Now I want to talk about what's happening with social media and how pornography, always on the lookout for new markets, is now gone and migrated to where the teens are. So just to give an example, 76% of teens are on Instagram, 75% Snapchat, 66 are on Facebook and the Facebook's going down because they're not on Facebook because their parents are and Twitter. Now where we know what we know is that pornography has migrated mainly to Instagram and Snapchat. And a lot of the pornography on Instagram and Snapchat is hidden behind emojis. Now they actually banned the eggplant emoji in 2015, but it's all over there, and that stands in for penises. This emoji, which if you look into Instagram or Snapchat and you see uh, conversations or whatever images, this stands for either breasts or testicles. No prizes for guessing what this stands for. And teardrops stand for ejaculate. So often the kids know how to hide their pornography behind emojis that their parents don't get. Now the other thing about Snapchat as well is it's set up what's called Snapchat Premium. Now in Snapchat Premium, this is where the pornography is. The, and what we know from Snapchat Premium is that a lot of the um, porn performers, and I'm not going to use the word porn stars because there's really a handful of porn stars. Most women are porn performers, they make no money, they leave, luckily if they've got the clothes on their back, um, they're not, they don't become porn stars. They don't become the Gemma Jamesons or whatever of the world. They end up often in the brothels of Nevada or um, being prostituted by the, jar, by the pimp who got them into porn in the first place. So there are about six companies, porn companies, that are set up that in now to actually set up Snapchat premium um, sites for porn performers. And you can get onto these sites for 
anything from 10 to 16 dollars a month and then you go from these sites to where the porn is and I've got from these sites straight onto Pornhub in like seven or eight seconds so there was a lot of cross-platforming going on Sonia Leone on Instagram has um, she's a porn performer she's actually closer to a porn star in that she does make a living from this she has 11.7 .7 million followers oh, and counting so when we talk about I'm getting some feedback here. When we when we talk about um, pornography, Details magazine talks about how and Details, by the way, is like Cosmopolitan for boys. Talks about how internet porn is changing teen sex, and what we see is they say there's an entire generation of young people who think sex ends with a money shot to the face. Well, yes, absolutely, because they're on Snapchat. They're like getting their porn from Instagram. And also, who uses free porn on Pornhub? Those without a credit card. So really, you're talking often about young kids. And they say the average age of first viewing pornography is 11. But when you speak to people who work with kids, I'm hearing 7 or 8 or 9. And often, they're not out looking for it. It's coming at them through Snapchat, Instagram, through video games, wherever. So... What we now know and what Details Magazine is telling us is there is indeed an entire generation who really <coughs> sees the money shot as the key. And in fact, there was one study done that asked um, young college students, um, what do you really want to do? What would you really, what's your favorite sex act? And the number one response was coming on her face. And one of the reasons they said they liked to come on a woman's face is they said because we know she doesn't like it. So this is clearly not about making love. I mean, it's a joke to say that pornography is about making love to women. Pornography is actually about making hate to women. That's what they do in porn. They make hate to women. Now, I often debate people who say there's no research. And this is, this is ludicrous. There's 40 years of peer-reviewed research. And these are just some examples. But I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on. Um, and what often happens in these debates when they say there's no research or the research shows pornography is, is positive for people, they'll cherry pick a study. Now, in social science, what you do is you go with the weight of the evidence. You can always find junk science, same as in climate change. You know, you'll find ch climate change deniers will point to one study that goes against the weight of the evidence. So this is the same with pornography. You can point to one study, a few studies, but when you look at what we know over 40 years, without a doubt, we know that the more men and boys use pornography, and the earlier they get to it, the more limited their capacity for intimacy, the more likely they are to use coercive tactics, including set bullying women and girls into sexting, increased engagement in risky sexual behaviors, Increased likelihood of perpetuating sexual, perpetuating sexual harassment and rape. Increased anxiety and depression. Increased habitual and addictive use. And erectile dysfunction. We see a big increase now in younger boys and men having erectile dysfunction. And it follows the map of their increase in the use of pornography. So there's no question these are the effects. And for women and girls having to figure out how to negotiate to live in a culture that is drenched in hardcore pornography without any help from adults. Because whenever I go into schools or colleges, I say to them, did anybody help you figure out how to live in this world of increased porn? They all say no, nobody. And in fact, we're drowning. This is what I hear over and over again from young women. Now, as young women are getting more and more desperate around this, the question is, why has feminism become more and more accommodating to the porn industry? So I'm going to give a sort of very potted history. And the question is, how did we move from porn equals violence against women to porn equals women's empowerment? So this has been the shift in mainstream feminist arguing, that it's no longer seen as violence against women, it's actually a form of empowerment. And I'm sure many of you listening have heard this over and over again. And, I mean, 
when I, again, first started doing this work, there was no question that feminists, if you called yourself a feminist, you were anti-porn. I mean, it would have been ludicrous for someone to call themselves a feminist and to be pro-porn. And the books we saw coming out, Andrea Dworkin's Pornography, Pornography and Silence by Susan Griffin, Not for Sale, Take Back the Night, all of them, it wasn't even an argument. It was presupposed that if you're going to take a feminist analysis, it's going to be anti-porn. And this is what Andrea Dworkin said in 83. And this is how she thought about pornography. Think about pornography as social control, a democratic use of terrorism against all women. And I emphasized all women purposely because she's talking about all women. A way of saying to every woman, look down, bitch, because when you look up, you're going to see your legs spread. And this is the understanding of radical feminism and pornography that grew out of our understanding of violence against women. Pornography was part of the larger, larger project of working against violence against women. And then we started to see other books coming out in the 90s and a bit later. For example, Bound and Gag by Laura Kipnis, which was very pro-porn. Hardcore by Linda Williams, where suddenly pornography was not so violent, but needed to be deconstructed in a more sophisticated way, which it certainly does, but not in the way that Linda Williams did. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, then we have Defending Pornography by Nadine Strossen, um, who was at one point um, head of the ACLU, and she argued for pornography. And I did a number of dates, did, uh, debates with Nadine Strossen, arguing that pornography is a form of free speech and we need to protect it. And then the most recent, I think, addition to this, and, and probably one of the most influential, was, and who would ever thought we would see these words put together? The feminist porn book. I mean, if you would have told me 20 years ago that you'd have the feminist porn book, and then underneath the politics of producing pleasure, you'd think it was a joke, right? A spoof. Actually, no, it was a mainstream book written and edited mainly by academics. And this is how, this is the review on Amazon. The feminist porn book identifies the importance of pornography as a form of expression and labor in which women and other minorities produce power and pleasure. I don't know who they're producing power and pleasure for, but it's certainly not for women. It's not for themselves and it's not for other women because men make porn, men get rich off porn, men jerk off to porn, and it's based on the monetization of women's bodies. So a structural view of pornography, which is what radical feminism had, which meant it affects all women, has been replaced by an individualistic view of women expressing themselves. So somehow pornography has become a form of sexual self-expression. Again, that's an individualistic view because it doesn't take into account the whole ecosystem of the business behind pornography, who's using it, whose pleasure we're talking about, and who's getting rich from it. And I want to give you an example of how this works. Um, when my book came out, it got a lot. Of, we got reviewed everywhere, and the most I would say the most negative review was in Ms. Magazine, written by Shira Tarrant, and uh, she's an academic. And I had written a book about pornography as an industry. I'd taken a structural approach, talked about the violence against women in the industry, talked about violence against women um, outside in the real world and what happens to women who are with men who use porn, how it reshaped our society, and specifically what it's like for the women in porn. And I'd interviewed women in porn and what their life was like. Often, often it's women after they leave porn will talk about it. And I had talked about how the women said, you know, they felt raped on the porn set and the abuse. And to argue against that, Shira Tarrant interviews a porn performer, April Flores, and she says, there is no doubt porn is a very physical job. However, it is a very individualized profession. A performer always has the choice of not doing something they are not comfortable with. So, first of all, indeed, it's a very physical job. It's also it's not a job. It's a form of abuse. And it's not an individualized profession. 
it is a business where the power does not lay in the hands of the porn performers. It's in the hands of the producers, the directors. And a performer, she says, always has the choice of not doing something not true. When you interview women who have been in porn, they say you can say no. But they tell you if you say no, we're going to let everybody in the industry know you said no to doing whatever. And you know what? You'll never work again in this industry. So you're blacklisted in the industry. So really, you're often forced into this. And I don't care if you sign a contract saying you'll do A, B, and C. You don't know at 18, 19, 20, or any age what you're actually signing a contract for if this has never happened to you. So a lot of women say on that day, that first day on the porn set, something crossed over in me and I don't know what it was. And I would say what often happened is you were raped on that porn set and you think because you signed a contract then it's not rape, when in fact what actually happened to you was abuse and rape and violence and that's what you experienced. Now this move is part of a larger shift away from radical feminism to neoliberal feminism that really took hold during the Reagan Thatcher years. So what we see happen in pornography <coughs> didn't happen just in pornography. It happened with prostitution, it happened with um, put feminism in general, is it gave way to a neoliberal individualistic position and that's thanks to these two who really made mainstream the neoliberalism that had been growing in the previous decades. So let's remember what feminism really was and still is and I'm going to use this bridge called My Back which was a book from 1981 but is as valid today as it was then and this is from Barbara Smith. Feminism is the political theory and practice to free all women, women of colour, working class women, poor women, physically challenged women, as well as white, economically privileged heterosexual women. Anything less than this is not feminism. So it was a collective sisterhood. It was liberation. When I joined feminism, I never heard of the word empowerment. That's an individualistic term. We always talk about collective liberation. And even if I'm okay, even if I'm doing fine, if you're not my sister, then I will walk across mountains to make it okay for you. That's the feminism I joined. That's radical feminism. That's to be contrasted with the neoliberal feminism, which is basically all about me, me, me. Now, the core of radical feminism is that women exist as a class. And as Andrea Dworkin said, the fate of every individual woman, no matter what her politics, character, values, qualities, is tied to the fate of all women, whether she likes it or not. This is what it means to be part of a subordinate class. Now, of course, all women are born with a kind of bullseye on their back. But the poorer you are, the more of colour you are, the more likely you are to have a bigger bullseye. But We've got that bullseye. And our job is to understand us as a collective class and that way we fight together as a collective class. Now, in a manifesto for third wave feminism that was put on Alternet, it was argued that feminism is something individual to each feminist. Well, I don't know about you, but I have no idea how you build a movement based on something that's individual to everyone in that movement. For example, what would the civil rights movement have looked like if we would have argued that the civil rights movement is something individual to each person? You don't build movements based on individual thinking. You build it on collective ideology that comes out of the lived experience of the people who are fighting for their liberation, not by individuals. And that sounds a lot like Margaret Thatcher's comment, there is no such thing as society. There's only individual men and women, which of course is ludicrous. Of course there is a society. Of course we're in this together. And if you want any example of just how much we are a society and how we depend on each other, look at what's happening now. Look at the way in which this pandemic has shown the cracks in this culture, the cracks in the society, the inequality, the way in which people of colour are suffering much, much more, poor people are suffering, 
yes, there's a society, a very unequal one, and different people get different um, cards dealt to them. But we are not just individual men and women. Now, the myth of neoliberalism, and this is where we see a lot of feminism moving, is that there is no structural inequality. It's just individuals. There's no systems of oppression. It's just either you're lucky or you're not, or you work hard or you don't. And there are no groups with collective interests. You're just, again, individuals. Now, this is really interesting because the idea is that the oppressed have no collective interests. Believe me, the oppressor class knows their collective interests and works together very nicely as a class, as a way to keep power. So in neoliberalism, the myth is there's just lots of individuals making lots of individual choices with lots of self-empowerment. So again, how are you going to build a movement to change society on individuals who are either who are just making empowered choices? And to be honest with you, empowerment is really, as is agency, an empirical question. <clears throat> are you talking about the agency of white, upper middle class, privileged women who do have more choices within the oppressive structure? Or are you talking about the agency of poorer women of women who have less choices. Because we're not all the same. As much as we join, we are part of a collective class, within that there are divisions. And this is why it's really important to have an intersectional understanding where we bring in class and race as well as sex. Now, this is how we got to the word sex work. Because sex work, again, is an individualistic concept. And whereas prostituted women is a collective understanding of the system. And sex work renders invisible the exploitation of women by decontextualizing it, sex work, what they say prostitution and sexual exploitation, we say, from the economic, political, and legal systems of oppression that make women a subordinate class. So when you talk about sex work, you render all of the deep context of it invisible and you just have individual women making individual choices and also the other thing that concept of sex work does the term is it keeps us focused on the women and takes our mind off the johns the pimps and the whole eco structure of patriarchy that makes it possible for men to buy and sell women so again another word that needs to be completely striped from vocabulary is sex work so what do we want and what do we do? This is the question that we have to ask ourselves as radical feminists. So there is a pan. Society is a pan. And the question is, what do we want? Do we want the pie? Do we want half the pie? Which is what liberal feminists wanted. Do we want the crumbs? Which is what neoliberal feminism tends to be happy with. Or do we want to get rid of the pie altogether and start afresh? And this is where radical feminism differs from all other types of feminism. We don't want half the pie. The pie is poisonous. It poisons everything it touches and everyone who eats from it. We want something new. Now, what would it look like? Well, we've got many ideas. What we know it won't look like is this, what we have now. And it will look in a way that makes life living for women, worth living for women and children. And you know what? For men. Because bizarrely, as much as they get all this privilege, they're not doing it so great either, a lot of them. And again, you need an intersectional analysis of men because not all men get all the privileges of patriarchy in the same way. So to end, what I'm going to say is that a lot of young women have been sold a bill of goods about feminism with empowerment, sex work, the slut war, and somehow it doesn't feel right. And when they get introduced to radical feminism, and I had that experience over and over again was teaching feminist theory courses for many, many years, is when they get introduced to radical feminism, it's like a light bulb goes off in the head. It's like suddenly you can literally see them exploding all over. Because really, for most women, You've been waiting for radical feminism all your life, even if you didn't know it. I know when I picked up Andrea Dworkin's first book at the tender age of 18, I started to read it. I remember thinking, 
this is what I've been looking for and I didn't even know it and it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life I cannot imagine what my life would look like without radical feminism I cannot imagine how I would have lived in this society without that how I would have made sense of my life of my women friends life of my sister's life I've got no idea so what I give a plea to all of you as as these times get worse and not just the pandemic but talking about the increase in prostitution talking about more and more violent pornography talking about increases in violence against women the answer to this has to be a fearless courageous brave feminism that refuses to flinch at male power and the only feminism I know that does that is radical feminism thank you so now I'll take questions thank you Gail I'm just waiting until my camera turns back on thank you so much for your presentation um, as you said it was 30 minutes of questions and answer right yes okay I'm gonna be timing that um, one of the first questions that I saw that was asked was, is what compels pornography producers to make this kind of violent content if supposedly men are not initially into into that kind of violence what compels the pornographers to make it if men are not into it was that the question yeah what compels uh, pornographers to make violent content if supposedly from biologically men are not into violence against okay. women okay. because it's it's a business model okay so they get into violent pornography very quickly because of the thud to the body when you mix violence with sex what you do is you give more sizzle to the arousal so a lot of it is about arousal and increasing the arousal because when you think about what makes sex interesting it's often the person you're having sex with the connections the intimacy there's none of that in pornography pornography is kind of um, you know an a, a empty shell so how do you keep them interested in something when they when the thing that makes you interested in sex is missing so you bring in other things like anger and rage and bizarre sexual acts that really torture women's bodies so it's just like saying to me do you think we're born with a desire for unhealthy food like McDonald's no but it's part of a business model and the more you feed people this the more they want it so really pornographers are in the business of developing a taste for this kind of stuff and the other important thing is that the more and more that men must jerk off to this the more they need something harder more novel so that's where this goes like that but I do not believe by, by, if I thought biologically that this is what men wanted I would say we should just go and live in caves there's no point in having a feminist movement because we can't fight with biology this is this is patriarchy and this is socialization okay um, another question was when you were talking about the hiding behind emojis uh, did you mean to say that even emojis are used to represent something sp uh, something sexual and therefore also pornography no no not the, the emojis represent certain things and behind them is the pornography so no not that the emojis are pornographic but that they are symbols of certain things that are in pornography for example the teardrops are behind those would be the pornography that specializes in men ejaculating on women's faces for example okay uh, there's another question that talks about the the prevalence or the push for normalization of uh, so-called sex work uh, especially in Western universities and when we try to go against those movements then we're we're being called the most terrible things by other women and the question is how do we con counter this well there are lots of organizations especially survivor-led organizations which are speaking out about what what it was like to be prostituted I mean the image that they have a lot of these groups of so-called sex work is this neoliberal image of women choosing what to do making their own decisions 
I think the most one of the most the most important voices out there have to be survivor voices who are explaining to people in the world what prostitution is, what their experiences were. For example, I want to give um, Rachel Moran a call out for space that she helped found and all the wonderful women in space. Um, and I think we need as a movement to absolutely have the Nordic model everywhere. We need to make it illegal for men to buy sex and decriminalize the women. There is no question the Nordic model is the only answer and the way to go. And I would also like to see pornography as part of that because pornography is filled with prostitution in many ways. Um, how can we approach and debunk the paradox that the left is putting itself into, which is being supposedly against capitalism, and recognize the systems of oppression and still defend... Whoa, this is a very confusing question, I'm sorry. Um, I, think, I think I get it. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think the argument is how... Tell me if it sounds right. Um, if the left, who understand capitalism and fight against it, how can they support pornography as a capitalist organization? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. That is a question that I have grappled with and, in fact, written about with my um, colleague and good friend, Bob Jensen. And we wrote um, an article, and I think it's on my... Um, website gaildines.com um, why you need to, why left something about why pornography is a left issue and you know this is a really good question because I have you know when I go into colleges and you meet people with a very sophisticated left-wing analysis you know critiques capitalism understands capitalism it's like all of a sudden that critique when it comes to pornography or the sex industry just disappears out of their head and they become neoliberals around this issue and I think part of that is that they're blinded by what they see as the sex that once you introduce what they see as sex they can no longer think straight because I've had many arguments with many people who I've respected around the many issues and that we would be on the same page around issues of capitalism and um, exploitation and yet on this issue they sound like they come from the right wing, conservative, pro-capitalist era. So that, that's a really good question, and I would recommend that people go and look at that article. And if it's not on there, I will put, get it up there on gaildines.com. And I think it's also on Bob Jensen's website. Perfect. Um, there is someone asking, um, is there any way to have access to any of your presentations? Because you said that you couldn't share them, but apparently in 2007 you sold uh, the, a DVD with Robert Jensen for like five dollars. That was different, that was actually an, a, a non-profit organization and that was put together by four different people. Um, okay. Uh, and we, I cannot distribute this first of all because it has pornography in it and um, because of certain legal issues. Now that on YouTube there's lots of talks up there which has similar to this, but I, I can't distribute this due to legal reasons. Okay, perfect. Um, the next question is, do you have some information on how my, many women use uh, pornography or access Pornhub? Well, what, we, what I've seen is um, they say in some studies, I've seen 20% of people on um, porn is hub is women, 30%. What we don't know is this. We don't know how long they're on there. We don't know what they're looking at. We don't know why they're going on there. We don't know if they're masturbating to it. And anecdotally, I can tell you what seems to be a lot of women who do go on to Pornhub are going on to see what the men are watching so that they can perform porn sex on men they hook up with. Um, there needs to be more research on this. The vast majority of research done on pornography and its effects is done on men. Uh, another question is, uh, is, have you heard or do you know about any research of uh, mental health practitioners using porn in psychological sex therapies? Um, I know it happens. I'm not a therapist and I'm not a psychologist. Um, 
but I have heard of it. Um, I don't know of any research. I'm sure there's lots of re there is research on it. I'm sure also that um, if they're using it in therapeutic situations, I imagine that it's getting. Um, it depends what you want. If you want, if your goal is for the guy to get an erection and have sexual intercourse with the woman, then yes, it probably works. If your goal is to develop uh, equal relationship with mutuality, intimacy, and connection, then I am sure it's an utter failure. Mm -hmm. um, next question: What do you think about reclaiming the world, the word "slut" and others such as "bitch" and the concept of reclaiming things at all? I'm sorry, you, you didn't come through clearly. The what do you think about reclaiming the word "bitch" and the word "slut"? And the conception of reclaiming these words at all, like what do you think about no. reclaiming? I, first, um, first of all, we can't reclaim because they were never ours in the first place. Place to claim. Um, secondly, these are words that are laden with meaning, symbols, ideology um, in a patriarchal society. You cannot reclaim the word and leave patriarchy intact. And the concept of slut came out of patriarchy as a way to shame and police women's sexual behavior. So until you change the context within which those words were developed and used to oppress women, then you cannot change the word. So I don't think it's reclaimable. And I think what you do if you use the word bitch or slut is you merely reaffirm the ideology and practices of patriarchy. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how do you argue with people who say that porn will always exist, so it's useless to fight it? Well, then I bring up, as I did in the beginning, that porn has probably existed for, I wouldn't say forever, but for a long time. But you have to talk about the porn industry. It's one thing to have pornographic images on a cave drawing. It's another thing to be four seconds away from hardcore porn. Um, on Pornhub. So the argument is, first of all, porn, the porn industry has not always existed. It took um, a long time to develop to what it is today. And like all industries, they can be regulated out of existence. So I don't argue in any way that just because we've had porn images floating around, that's the same as saying that we've always got to have a porn industry. Thank you. Next question is, how do you take care of your mental health and maintain relationships with men, knowing that many of them are probably watching this violent content? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you, you see, if you're a woman, a heterosexual woman, and you are with a man who uses porn, I, I don't see how you can take care of your mental health in ways that need to be taken care of. How can you stand to be with somebody who is aroused by images of violence against women? And I say this knowing that most young men use porn. You know, women are in, young women are, and older women, but especially young women, because it's, main, it's mainly concentrated in the younger age who grew up with the internet, they're in a terrible position of, you know, wanting to have a partner um, and yet having to live in a world where they know that most of the men are using porn, um, which is why it's going to take a movement and not on an individual basis, because we're not going to stop men using porn man by man, individual by individual. It, it's really going to have to become a movement whereby men cannot use porn because we've regulated it, um, and also because, just like drinking and driving, when I was growing up, People would say, you know, I'll have one for the road before they left a bar. You, you don't hear that anymore. Why not? Because of the public health campaign that you don't drink and drive. We need to do a similar thing around pornography. This needs to be much larger than individuals. Um, and I think for young women, you cannot be with men who use porn. Any woman, you can't be with a man who uses porn. You can't do that to yourself because you have to jump through so many hoops ideological hoops to make that seem okay to yourself and it's it's i think it's dangerous to your mental health 
The next question is, is it worth trying to convince men or, is, or do we just fully focus on women in our activism? Um, that's a very good question. No, I think, I think we do both. I think we do both. I think we definitely focus on women because every oppressed group frees themselves. You don't ask the oppressor to free you. The oppressor does not stop oppressing you because you make a good case for the fact you don't like it. They stop oppressing you because you make it impossible for them to continue to oppress you. But there are some men out there, not enough and not many, who have joined the fight against pornography and um, they should not be the leaders of the battle, that needs to be women. But no, I think there's a place in the movement for men to become our allies around this. And also, um, men do need to stand up to other men. You can't leave it to a bunch of impoverished feminists to fight this multi-billion dollar industry. But again, the focus has to be on women. Thank you. Um, next question is, some people say that there's a difference between film sexual violence and pornography and claim that pornography doesn't have to be violent or oppressive towards women. How do you respond to that and raise feminist consciousness around pornography as violence? Um, in oh, sorry, can you speak a bit slower because it's not so clear. So the first sorry. part. Yeah. Um, the question is, how do you respond to those people that say that there's a difference between film sexual violence and pornography? Between and film sexual violence and porn. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's take that one first. Um, pornography is film sexual violence in most cases. So I don't see the distinction. Okay. Um, the second part of the question is, how do you raise feminist consciousness around pornography as violence? By building the feminist movement and making it radical and doing what we did. Um, going out speaking, lecturing, webinars like this, writing books, writing blogs. I mean, we have, um, just as the internet has um, brought down on our heads a multi-billion dollar a year industry called pornography, we can also find spaces there to get this message out. So we absolutely have to rebuild the feminist movement to one that refuses to collaborate or cooperate with the pornographers, refuses to give out the narratives and ideologies of pornography, and really get back to where we were. That is, pornography is a form of violence against women, both in its production and its consumption. Thank you. The next question is from a concerned mother, and she is asking where and how do I begin having this conversation with my 11-year-old son and my children, who are both male and female? Okay, I have the answer to that. So I am also um, president of Culture Reframed. That's Culture Reframed with an ED on the end. If you go onto our website, Culture Reframed, go onto the Parents Programme, we have um, two, pro two programs, one for parents of tweens, one for parents of teens. They are robust uh, programs that give you all the information you need in order to help build resilience and resistance in your kids to porn. And at the end, we have scripted out conversations that you can have with your kid around uh, pornography, sexting, consent. So this is um, the only program of its type. So I would recommend definitely for any parent out there to go on culturereframed.org, go on to, there's lots on our website, and also go on there, you can get onto our parents' program. And it, each program took about 18 months to build. They were built by experts in adolescent psychology, sexual health, pediatricians, um, sociologists, media specialists. There's a lot of stuff up there that is absolutely crucial for parents. Thank you. Um, we have 10 minutes left. So what do you think of the new rise in popularity of the OnlyFans platform? Do you see it as becoming a sanitized version of the sex industry? Which, which platform? OnlyFans. Yes, I think um, it's in its early infancy. I'm waiting to see what happens. But it's a camming. The, the, you mean the camming platform? Yeah, I think it's that platform where you can only enter if you pay, so you have yeah, to pay. Yeah, it's, it's a canning platform, and um, it's basically, again, prostitution once removed in that. And it's another way for women 
uh, for men to have access to women's bodies. Um, the only difference here is some of the women who went, who um, go on to, who actually are on that, went on there because um, they get more money from camming. The actual um, owners take less money, less percentage. But again, it's the commodification and monetization of women's bodies. You know, when we live in a society where we see it's okay to commodify and monetize women's bodies on every level, and especially for sex. And my argument would be, you know, this is not what women are here for. We're not here in order for men to buy us and in order for us to sexually titillate them and sexually arouse them. As long as you have an industry, and I would put this as part of the porn industry as well, um, Camming, is that as long as you have an industry that says that women's bodies exist for men's use, we are never going to have the kind of society that we want as feminists because we've got that juggernaut that is taking, uh, is taking our arguments and draining them of their politics because it's saying to men, you have access and you have the right to women's bodies. Thank you. There is a question. Um, yeah, it's asking about your thoughts about the frequent depiction of transsexuals with a penis in porn uh, where lesbian women are showcased. Well, what I can tell you about um, trans, the so-called transgender porn is that, um, because we're not sure exactly what it is and who's making it, is that um, from what I've read in the porn business, on the porn business website, is that it's mainly men who identify as straight who are the users of that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any research about the increase of sexual violence due to pornography? Oh yes, lots of research on that. Now, a lot of it is about um, correlation um, and that we know that. But now there's increasing research on causation, which are what we call longitudinal studies, where they follow boys, they um, control for variables, and what they see is that the only variable um, that seems to increase violence against women in the studies that they, in the boys that they're following is uh, use of porn. So yes, no question. And also the question would be, given that how we know images work, and given that we have a multi-billion dollar industry called advertising, whose goal is to change your mind through images and change your behavior, how would it be possible for boys and men to use porn and not be changed by it? How would it be possible for them to masturbate to these images, have a powerful impact on the body as masturbation does, and then not be affected by it? I mean, I would want someone to make the case of how they're not affected rather than me having to make the case that they are affected. It's so obvious given how we know how images work. And we live in an image-based culture. Most of our communication, most of our messages, most of our ideologies come from images. And, you know, in pornography is really the propaganda of patriarchy. I can't think of any better propaganda where you mix the violence with arousal. It is such a great way to deliver to men those messages. And where could we find that study? Oh, there's, if you go on the Culture Reframed website, we have a whole academic library. Okay. Um, there are two last questions, which is, there are many definitions to the word porn, and this user wants to, wants to know which one do you use. And um, so many definitions to? To the, to the word pornography. Well, I don't really get into that because there's an industry, and if the porn industry produces it and calls it porn, and then go to it in order to use it for pornog for, as pornography, then that is porn. I'll just take their definition. It's like asking, what's the definition of a car? Well, what the car industry produces. You know, we get locked up in definitions as a way to really not get to the real point. We don't, pornography, I would say at this moment, is what the porn industry can, uh, produces and what men know. And men know exactly what they're going for when they go to porn. It's not like they go looking for porn and accidentally land on the Bible or something, you know, online or something. They know exactly what they want. So I would say, um, and you know, my colleague again, Bob Jensen, he calls it the definitional dodge, where we spend so long trying to define it that we get away from the real issues. 
Thank you. Uh, question about what do you think about lesbian porn? Well, again, what we know from so-called lesbian porn is that its main the the main consumers of it through the industry are men. Um, it's made for men on men, um, and that um, this is their sort of hypersexualized, sexist image of what lesbians look like. And of course, their hope is that um, the lesbian so-called women in les I won't say lesbians, the women in the so-called lesbian porn will actually realize the error of their ways and drag him into the um, sex. So it's just a myth. Of, um, and there is a subgenre made by lesbians for lesbians. Um, again, I would argue that you are exploiting women. Um, you are exploiting their bodies. You are monetizing it. You are profiting off it. And what right do you have to have access to women, the women's bodies at their most vulnerable? So um, I think if people want to make images of themselves, with themselves, and I'd be very careful about doing this because we know we've got revenge porn out there, that's a different thing. But when the images circulate within the industry and become part of the culture, then it becomes all our issues. Okay. And I think the last question that we can take is, do you have any advice on how to push politically for sexual education in schools that include porn deconstruction? Yeah, this is a really great question. And this is, first of all, I mean, and I don't know where that question came from, what country. Um, in the United States, just getting any sex ed into schools is a problem. Um, it's better in other countries, in other Western countries, but I don't see any sex ed that actually takes porn as its focus. And in fact, at Culture Reframed, we are going to be developing some modules on our, parent, on our website that actually do that. And what I would say to parents is that you insist, absolutely insist, that your school develops a good sex ed curriculum and that pornography is very front and center because you cannot teach about sex ed until you teach about porn because most of those kids who are doing teaching sex ed, who are, sorry, most of those kids who are having sex ed taught to them have actually already been taught sex ed through pornography. So you have to undo the damage that porn has done in order to start building up a sex ed program. But I say to parents everywhere, and anyone who's interested in the well-being of children, schools have dropped the ball. They have let kids navigate this alone. They act as if we're still partying in the, 19th cent in the 20th century and porn is not part of our lives. Where are the schools? Where are all those people who are charged with taking care of kids? Where is the American Academy of Pediatrics? Where are all these groups saying we need to have a robust form of sex education that deals with the life that these kids are living now?